Hello, and welcome back. The other day, I was on an American Airlines flight and opened the current issue of their in-flight magazine to the puzzle section. I did the New York Times crossword puzzle that was there, and then there were three Sudoku puzzles on the next page listed as easy, medium, and hard. The easy puzzle was, of course, very easy. Then I used my own pencil and paper method for the medium puzzle, only using a modicum of candidates, and again, it was quite simple. But because I was using a ballpoint pen instead of a pencil and an eraser, even with the limited number of candidates I filled in, it got pretty messy. So I decided to work on the hard puzzle with absolutely no candidates, like my friend Harold Nolte does on his channel, to see how long it would take me. And I got it done in about four or five minutes. I didn't really time it. But I wondered how long it would take to solve that hard puzzle using complete candidate lists and filters the way I do in my complete course. So I tore the page out of the magazine, and when I got to my destination, I entered the puzzle into my software, and I was able to solve it in less than 60 seconds. Actually, 55.7 seconds on the stopwatch. It was really just a baby puzzle, but was rated hard because it was a pencil and paper puzzle in a magazine intended for amateurs. Not like us. Ha ha. So today, I thought it would be an interesting exercise to solve this puzzle all three ways so that we can compare the results. First, we're going to solve it with absolutely no candidates filled in. None. Then we're going to solve it using my pencil and paper method with just a handful of candidates here and there. And then finally, we're going to solve it with full-on, complete, and automated candidate lists using candidate filters if necessary, okay? Now, it might be a good idea for you to pause the video and try solving the puzzle yourself first before watching this demonstration, but that's entirely up to you. The puzzle has 29 givens, so right away this should tell us that it won't be too difficult, regardless of the listed rating of hard. I'm sure the steps I use right now will not be exactly those that I used on the plane, but it should be close, and of course, it's going to take a little longer because I will be explaining each move to you instead of just going through it on my own without talking. All right, here we go. Let's start off by doing as much cross-hatching as we can, and instead of cycling through the numbers, let's just enter stuff as we see it. Now, I wish I could color the cells to point things out to you, but unfortunately, I cannot enter digits into cells while the coloring feature is turned on. So it would take way too much time to be constantly switching back and forth. But if you look closely, you will see that whenever I click on a cell like this or like this, there will be a faint yellow border around that cell to show that it is selected. So I hope you can all see that. And I'll use real coloring from time to time whenever I think it is necessary. So down here in the lowest shoot, we've got an 8 in row 7 and an 8 in row 9, and we've got an 8 in column 7, so that means we can put an 8 in this cell right there. And now because of that 8, this 8, and this 8, that means we can put an 8 in this cell. And because of this 3 and this 3, we can put a 3 right there. And now because of this 4, this 4, this 4, and this 4, we call that a foursome, we can put a 4 in that cell, and because of these two fours, we can put a four in this cell up here. Now let's look at the nines. Because of these two cells in columns two and three, and this one in row one, we can put a nine right there. And because of this nine and this nine in columns five and six, and this one over here in row five, we can put a nine into that cell. And then down here in the bottom, we've got a nine here in row eight, and nine in row nine, and this nine in column nine. That means we can put a nine right there. And then finally, we can finish off the nines by putting a nine in this cell right here because of these two nines in row one and row three and the ones in column seven and column nine. And now because of this five up here in row one, we can put a five in this cell. And now these three cells up here in row one and in block three, they must be solved for four, six, and seven. Those are the only three numbers left for that block. But because we have a 4 and a 6 in column 8, we know that this cell must be the 7, and these two cells must be a naked pair of 4 and 6. And now we have a full house in column 8, and we can put a 1 right there. Now, as a general rule for when you are solving any puzzle, when you're looking for your next step, what you want to do is gravitate toward houses that have the most numbers filled in. That way, it'll give you your best shot of finding something new. 
So here in column four, we have six numbers already filled in, and there are only three empty cells, so that means that's a triple. And that has to be one, two, and three, because we have four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So now we see we've got a one in row seven, and we've got a one in row nine. So these two cells cannot be a one. They can only be two and three. That means this cell must be the one. And now, because these cells have to be two and three, that means these three remaining cells in block eight have to be one, five, and six. And because we have a one here and a six here in row seven, this has to be the five. And this has to be a naked pair of one and six. So we've got two and three in these vertical cells, and we've got one and six in these horizontal cells in block eight. So now, because we know these two cells are one and six, that means these two cells have to be two and five. And since there's a two up here in column two, this has to be the five, and this has to be the two. And because this four and five are here in row seven, we know that these two cells down here in block nine must be solved for the four and the five, leaving only a seven for this cell. And because there are only two remaining empty cells in row seven, we know they must be two and three. And here's a two. So this has to be the three. And this has to be the two. And remember, this was a naked pair of two and three. So this also has to be a three. And now there are only three cells left in block seven. And they must be two, six, and seven, right? So we've got a six and a seven in column one. So this has to be the two. And then these two have to be the six and the seven. So we've got six and seven here, one and six here, and four and five here. And we've also got four and six up here. Those are all naked pairs. And now we can do some more cross-hatching on the twos because of this two and this two, there has to be a two in this cell. And because of these two twos and this one up here in row two, there must be a two in this cell. And finally, there must be a two up here in row one, column three, because there's a two in column one, a two in column two, and a two in row three, and a two in row two. That's another foursome, so that has to be a two. All right, now let's take a look at row one. And at first glance, it might look like there are five empty cells in that row, but remember, these two are a naked pair of four and six, so they're already accounted for. That means there are only three empty cells left in that row, and they must be solved for one, three, and eight. And because we've got a three in column two and we've got a three in column six, these two cells must be one and eight and we can put a three in this cell right there. Now we can do some more cross hatching on the threes. We've got a three here and we've got a three here. So that means we can put a three in this cell. And then because of this three and this three and this three and this three, we know a three must go into that cell, okay? Now in column one, there are only two cells left and they must be one and five. And here's a five in row four. So this has to be the one and this has to be the five. So now we can cross hatch a five here in block six because of this five and this five, there's only one cell left for a five and we can put a five right there. But remember down here, we had a naked pair of four and five in block nine. So because of this five, this cell must be the four and this cell must be the five. And because we had a naked pair of four and six up in block three, because of this four down here, we know this one must be the six, and this one must be the four. And now we've got a full house in column nine, so this must be a six, leaving only the one and the seven for these last two cells of row six. And because there's a one already here in block five, this must be the seven, this must be the one, and now we have a full house here in block six, this must be a seven. And another full house in row four means this must be a six. And because we had a naked pair of one and six down here in block eight, this must be the one and this must be the six. Now we've got a full house in column five. So that means this has to be a seven. And we've got a naked pair of one and eight left in these two cells. And because of this one in row three, this must be the eight and this must be the one, meaning this must be an eight because that's a full house in row one. And now we've got another full house in row three, so we can put a seven there. And now we've got two cells left in block one. They must be one and five. And because we've got a one down here, this is the five. This is the one. And these two cells must be eight and six. And because of this eight up here, this must be the six. And this must be the eight. And down here, we had a naked pair of seven and six. And because of this six, this must be the seven. And this must be the six. And the puzzle is complete. So let's reset the puzzle. And now we're going to solve it again using my pencil and paper method. 
The approach for this method is described in lesson number six of that series. With the pencil and paper method, I normally recommend first looking at the ones, then the twos, then the threes, etc., in numerical order, and then when you get to the nines, you just go back to the ones and start the cycle all over again, just like we do when we are using candidate filters. So let's begin by doing that. But of course, when you are solving puzzles on your own, you should always immediately enter anything that jumps out at you at any random moment, which will speed up your solving time. So let's see how long it takes to solve the puzzle this way. Now I realize that we just solved this puzzle a minute ago, so we might be tempted to use our memory from that last solving, but we won't do that. We'll just try to do it exactly as if we were seeing it for the first time, okay? So basically what we're going to do here is enter conjugate pairs and naked pairs. And we'll enter naked triples, but only if they are configured with just two candidates in each of the three cells. In other words, A, B, B, C, A, C. I call this a two by two by two triple. And if a candidate appears three or more times in a particular house, we'll just leave it blank so as to keep the puzzle cleaner looking. All right, so there's nothing on the ones, and because of this two and this two, we can put a conjugate pair of two into those two cells. And because of this two, all by itself in column two, we know that there must be a two in one of these two cells. One of those two twos must be true. And now they rule row nine, and because of these two twos in column eight and nine, we can put another conjugate pair of twos in these two cells. One of those two twos must be true. And that's it for the twos. So now let's go to the threes, and there are only a couple of threes here, so we can put a three into this cell and enter it just like that. And that's it for the threes right now, so let's move to the fours. We've got a four here, a four here, a four here, and a four here. That means a four must go into that cell. And likewise, because of these two fours in column five and six, we can put a four into that cell. And now because of that four and this four in row three and this one in column eight, we can put a conjugate pair of fours into those two cells. And because of these two fours down here and also that one in column eight, we can put a conjugate pair of fours into those two cells, and those four candidate fours form an X-wing. So now the fours are all accounted for in all nine blocks, so let's move to the fives. And because of this five up here in row one, we know that a five must go into one of those two cells, and we might as well do the nine while we're at it, because this nine blocks those same three cells, so that must be a naked pair of five and nine. And now we can put a conjugate pair of fives down in these two cells because of the two fives in these two columns here and here, okay? So let's move to the sixes, and because of this six in row two and in row three, this also has to be a conjugate pair of sixes because we've got a six in column eight. So now we've got a naked pair of four and six and a naked pair of five and nine in this block, which means there's only one number left and we can put a seven in there right now. So we might as well finish off column eight. Down here we've got a one and an eight, and because of this eight in row nine, this must be the one, and this must be the eight. All right, now back to the sixes. Because of this six in column four and this six in row seven, we can put a conjugate pair of sixes into those two cells. And now because this six rules row seven and these two sixes rule row eight, we can put a conjugate pair of sixes into these two cells because we've got a six up here in column one. And there's nothing on six in this middle horizontal shoot, so let's move to the sevens. And I don't see anything on seven, so let's move to the eights. And we can crosshatch an eight into this cell because we've got an eight in column seven and in column eight and in row six, so an eight must go right there. And now because of this eight in column five, we can put a conjugate pair of eights into those two cells. And because of these two eights in row four and row six, we can put a conjugate pair of eights into those two cells. And there's nothing we can do with eight in block one, so let's move to the nines. We've got a nine in column two and in column three and in row one. That means a nine must go into this cell. But let's take a look over here. If this nine is true, that means this nine has to be false. And if this is a five, then this cannot be a five. Remember, these are by-value cells, so we can solve all three of those cells. Next, we can crosshatch a nine into this cell because we have a nine in row six and a nine in row five, and we have a nine in column six and a nine in column five. So a nine must go right there. And lastly, we can finish off the nines by putting a nine in this cell 
because there are two nines in these two rows and there are two nines in these two columns. So this has to be a nine, which means it can't be a two. And that was a conjugate pair on two, so we can enter the two and enter the nine. And now because this two rules row eight and these two twos rule row nine, we know a two must go into one of these two cells. So now let's take a look at column four. It only has three empty cells and they must be one, two, and three. So because we have a one in row seven and we have a one in row nine, we know that neither of these cells can be a one, so they must be two and three. And this cell must be the one, so we can erase the two and put in a one, and that means this two is true, this one is true, and now this naked pair of two and three eliminates that two, but this conjugate pair of twos in row nine eliminates this two. So this has to be a three, and this cannot be a three, so these two cells must be two and three. Now let's take a look at row seven. These three empty cells have to be solved for three, five, and seven, right? And because there's a three and a seven in block eight, this has to be the five. So this cannot be a five, that must be a five. And now we've just got three and seven left. And because there's a three here, this has to be the seven, and this has to be the three. So now we know that this must be a naked pair of one and six in this block, and this must be a naked pair of four and five in this block. But now look what we have in column nine. Because of this four over here in row six, this cell cannot be a four, but these three cells together must be four, five, and six. So that means this cell must be five and six. And now the reason we enter it like that is because as soon as we solve one of these three cells, we're gonna know the value of the other two. This is a naked triple, but it's in such a way that there are two different candidates in each cell. So now we only have one cell left for row eight, and that's gotta be a five. And now we can crosshatch some twos. Because of this two and this two and this two, we can put a two into this cell. And because of these two twos in rows two and three, and because of this two here in column two, we can put a conjugate pair of twos into these cells. Now we have an X-wing on the twos, okay? But these three cells in block seven must be two, six, and seven. And because we've got a six here and a seven here, we know this must be a two. So because that's a two, this cannot be a two, and this cannot be a two, and we can solve these two cells of our X-wing, leaving a naked pair of seven and six and seven and six in these two cells. Now let's take a look at column one. We have three spaces left, and they must be one, three, and five. But we've got a five in row one and a five in row four, so this cell must be the five, and these two cells have to be one and three, okay? But if this is a five, that means this cell over here cannot be a five and it has to be a six. And if this cell is a six, this cannot be a six. And if this cell is a four, this cell cannot be a four and this cell cannot be a four. And if this cell is a five, then this cell cannot be a five. And we can solve all six of those cells. Those were all bivalue cells in that vertical shoot. So now because of this three here in row five, we can put a conjugate pair of threes into these two cells, and we can put a conjugate pair of threes into these two cells. But one of these two threes must be true, so this three cannot be true, therefore that three is true, and we could have solved this three up here in row one, column one before. These two threes are blocking rows two and three, and this three blocks column two, so that has to be a three. So in this naked pair, this is the three, and this is the one. And so we can solve those three cells, leaving a naked pair of eight and six, and eight and six in those two cells. Now we can crosshatch a five into this cell because fives rule row four and row six, so that's a five. And now we've got two cells in row six. They must be one and seven. Because of this one, that has to be a seven. That has to be a one, leaving a seven here. So this cell has to be a six, so that negates this six and that negates this one and we can solve those three cells. So now we have a full house in column five, so this has to be a seven. These two cells must be one and eight, but there's a one here, so this has to be eight. That has to be one. Now we've got a full house in row one. That has to be an eight, but if that's an eight, this cannot be an eight. And if this is a six, this cannot be a six. And if this is a six, this cannot be a six. And if this is a seven, this cannot be a seven, and we can solve all of those cells. So now we have a full house in row three, so that's a seven. 
And then we've got one and five for these two cells, and there's a one here, so this is the five. And because there's a five here, this is the one. And the puzzle is done again. So that took about eight minutes, but that's only because I was talking the whole time and pointing out sideline stuff. This puzzle can easily be solved in less than five minutes using that method of entering candidates. Okay, so now we're going to solve this same puzzle one last time looking at all the candidates like I do in my complete course. So let's reset the puzzle and add the candidates. And I can tell you right now that we're not going to need to use any candidate filters. Of course, it's probably going to take a little longer than 55 seconds to do it while explaining the moves to you, but you will see the difference in the speed of solving, I'm sure. The beauty of doing it this way is that when we see only one candidate in a cell, it will represent a naked single and can therefore be entered immediately with one click. And likewise, when we see just two candidates in a cell, we can be sure that it is truly a by-value cell and can therefore only be solved for one of the two candidates in that cell. And again, we won't use our memory from the last two times solving this. We'll just act like we're seeing the puzzle for the first time, okay? All right, here we go. Up here in row one, we've got a naked single on seven, and that leaves a naked pair of five and nine in column eight. So there can be no other fives or nines in that column. So we can enter those three singles. Now in column four, we've got a naked pair of two and three. So we can eliminate that two and that three and solve these cells. And then in that block, we can eliminate that two and that three and those twos. So now we've got a naked single on five, and that leaves a naked single here, 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 and here. Now we've got a naked pair of one and six in row eight, so that can't be a six, that has to be a five, and that has to be a two. This is a naked single on two, so we can solve that. And if we look up here in column one, this is a hidden single on nine. That's the only nine in that column, so we can solve that. And now that eliminates the nine from this cell. We can solve that for five, that for nine. And now we've got a naked pair of one and seven in row two, so this must be a five. In row five, we have a naked pair of eight and six, so that can't be an eight or a six. That can't be a six. That can't be a six, and that can't be a six. So we can solve all of those cells. These are naked singles, and it looks like there's just going to be naked singles from here on out. So you can see how easy this is when you can see all of the candidates. It helps you solve puzzles very quickly. And just a couple more here, and that's it. Oops. So that was three ways to solve the same puzzle. It's fun to do the puzzles any of these three ways. Now, if you like to solve puzzles without any candidates, like we did the first time through, I highly recommend that you check out Harold Nolte's YouTube channel, which is listed under his own name, or you can visit his website at sudokuprimer.com. And that's right, that's pronounced primer, not primer. But to me, the greatest reward comes with solving extremely difficult puzzles using the sophisticated techniques that I teach in my complete course. These techniques require you to be able to see all the remaining candidates and to know how to analyze them and understand their relationships to each other. It will be practically impossible for you to solve those kinds of puzzles without filling in any candidates or without knowing how to make chains or how to recognize other commonly occurring patterns like swordfish, skyscrapers, and unique rectangles, etc. But it's up to you. You should solve puzzles the way that it is the most challenging, appealing, satisfying, and rewarding for you. In closing, let me make a clarification here, if I may. The ratings on printed puzzles you will find in newspapers, magazines, and puzzle books are always going to be way higher than they would be if you found the same puzzle on a smartphone or computer app. This is because it really is much harder to solve puzzles without candidate lists. And don't forget, if anyone has a puzzle from any source that you would like to see me solve in a future video, please send it to me at sudokuswami at gmail.com, okay? And be sure to mention whether you would like to see it solved using my pencil and paper method or by using complete and automated candidate lists using chains and other solving techniques that I teach in my complete course. 
Okay, that's going to do it for today. If you like this video, please click the red subscribe button, the thumbs up icon, and click the little bell icon if you would like to be notified of new video uploads. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Until then, be well and be happy.